Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wa mursaleen Sayyidana Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Wa ba'd In the name of Allah, the Magnificent, the Merciful I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I send peace and blessings to all of the Prophets, to Moses, to Jesus and especially to our beloved Prophet Muhammad his first companions forever I begin with the greeting words of the righteous Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Ethiopia Ard al-Habasha the land of Abyssinia the land of great kings the land of mystery, spirituality the land of ancient history as a young African American with West Indian parentage I always wondered about Ethiopia this land for my family and for those African Americans living in the West always had a type of magic to it, a type of mystery it was a land where African people were proud where early civilization developed some say that even the first man walked this land but in my quest I realized that Ethiopia was more than just a land of history it was a land of high spirituality it is said that lost Ark of the Covenant lies in this land it is also said that great Christian rulers and kings walked this land and maintained the teachings of Jesus peace be upon him as a Muslim I came to understand that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him when living in Mecca and when he found that he was persecuted and his followers needed help he told them if you go out to the land of Habasha to Abyssinia there you will find a king who oppresses nobody it is a land of truth Hiya Ardun Sidq how did he know that it was a land of truth? why did he send his followers into Africa before he sent them to Palestine before he sent them to Persia, even to Yemen. Why? Join me on our search for the history of this beautiful land and also for the true story of Najashi, the great Negus of Aksum, and also light upon what happened to the Sahaba, to their families in this historic mystical land. Join me in this journey of a lifetime. As I leave you in peace, Assalamu Alaikum. My journey starts in the relatively young city of Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. It's founded in 1887 by the Emperor Menelik and has grown to a population of just over 3 million. To my astonishment, I found out that a large percentage of the people of Addis Ababa are Muslim. In fact, 40% of Ethiopia is Muslim. It may seem hard to imagine that in a country that has recently turned away from communism, Islam has never ceased to grow. In fact, Islam is growing at an unprecedented rate. Minarets of mosques dominate the old town and the call to prayer reverberates around the city. Addis Ababa is a city on the move. The hustle and bustle of daily life continues unabated. Down every street and around every corner, Muslims go about their chores. Whether it's to the mosque or shopping, it became quite apparent that Islam is here to stay. Oh, <laughs> 
Because I came on a quest to find the role of Islam in Ethiopia today, I knew that one of the best places to convert Muslims was at the mosque. And so I set off to the biggest mosque in Addis Ababa, known as Masjid al-Imam Hassan ibn Abi Talib. Here I met an elder of the city, Sheikh Kamil al-Sharif, a son of one of Addis Ababa's most beloved and well-known shuyukh. As Sheikh Kamil's name also indicates a sharif he is a noble one, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I myself belong to the Ahl al-Bayt salam. We Ahl al-Bayt, our grand-grandfathers has came to Ethiopia from Arab Venezuela, passing the Red Cross, uh, the Red Sea, to the Somali border, and they penetrated to deep into Harar. The cause of their immigrating to Harar or coming to Harar to Africa is to call for Islam. Forgate. Islam and teach the people of that area Islamic principle. It is known and worth mentioning that the Ahlul Bayt in all the way from their grandfather Muhammad and until the last day they are basically devoted for Islam. Wherever they go they preach for Islam work for Islam, they give guidance and proper teaching to all Muslims and approach non-Muslims also to accept Islam. I found out that Sheikh Campbell's family comes from the legendary city of Hara, situated in the east of Ethiopia. He also told me that Hara was one of the main centers of Islamic learning for over 800 years. I had to find out more of this ancient city and arrange with Sheikh Kamil to journey there. Before my journey, I had the privilege to meet with some of the elders of Hara. They have established a special trust in the Harari National League in order to preserve the history and culture of the city. Amazingly, the language we all felt comfortable speaking was Arabic. I was amazed just listening to these men talk about Hara. More and more, I wanted to get to the city and see it for myself. What got my interest going even more were the books that were brought along for me to go through. Here in front of my eyes were pieces of history coming alive. The Harari Trust actively involved in making sure that no one forgets about Harari. On the way to Harari, we came across a very old mosque on the trade routes where camels once traveled. The caretaker explained that many caravans passed through on their way to selling their wares in the interior. The simple architecture of the mosque reminded me of similar structures I had seen in my travels through North Africa and Arabia. Mm. 
جميل جدا هذا مثل اليمن As I entered, I felt a profound sense of hundreds of years of worship drifting down on me. I realized that this mosque stands in testimony to the believers of Islam. We continued onwards to the city of Hara and arrived there just after dark. I had to wait one more night to see why the city was so dairy amongst Muslims. Early the next morning, I traveled to the outskirts of the city to get a better view. The search for Islam in Ethiopia has led me to the great walled city of Hara. This ancient town, set in southeastern Ethiopia, was once the most important center in the northeastern side of the continent of Africa. It is set in the classical Islamic lines, and when we look at the city in the background, we see the Jamia or the main mosque in the center, and the town surrounds the hill, and on the bottom is a great wall, which extends for almost a square kilometer around the town of Hara. It is a town of mystery. It is a town of great scholarship. It once was the link between the African continent and Arabia and India. The people of Hara were known for minting their own coins hundreds of years ago. They were also known for great scholars for a spiritual people, for crafts, for books. And it is said that the books of Hara were even being read in Ottoman Turkey and in other parts of the Muslim world. And so we have reached one of the most important parts of our journey, the great city of Hara. Let us see what we can find. For hundreds of years, this city was closed to foreigners. As an exclusive Islamic center, non-Muslims were not permitted Hara. I was dumbfounded when I learned that there are 82 mosques in this small city. Imagine 82 mosques that take care of the needs of those situated in their immediate vicinity. This is an example of the many masjids in the walled city of Hara. It is said that there are over 82 masjids in a 48 hectare space. It is the most densely populated uh, area in terms of masjids per square meter. And this is one of the mysteries of Hara. This is Masjid al-Arabi, the Arab mosque, which was built around 1875 by the Egyptians. And it is one of the local uh, centers for the people who are living in this particular section in Hara. And you'll find this all over the city, that about 40 families and an imam are uh, basically uh, uh, situated around the mosque and this gives us the flavor all around the city. These mosques are of course smaller in size, they comprise about uh, uh, 40 persons. As you know, 40 persons, uh, it will enable you also to have the Friday prayer. But the main purpose to make it 40 percent, not only to uh, make Friday prayer, prayer, but the Imam of, or we call him Lazim, the Imam of that mosque is responsible uh, for 40 household. Uh, the, these mosques are situated in such a way uh, to be the center for these 40 families. Hara was once surrounded by a great stone wall to keep out wild animals and the enemy. This gave rise to Hara being known as the walled city. Inside its walls, scholars from all over the Muslim world were teaching and producing detailed works on Islam. Many of them were also actively involved in closeness to Allah by building on their strong spiritual beliefs. This gate that we find ourselves at now is called Bedri Badi or Bab al Hakim. And it is one of the best preserved gates in the walled city of Hara. It has a very interesting history. It is said by the local historians that over 400 of the Fuqaha, the jurists of Islam, lived within the area near this gate. They eventually lives for the preservation of the city and have left a beautiful heritage and a deep tradition. 
And so, again, the gates open up the mysteries of the city. There are five within Hara, and let us see if we can find even more. The gates' uh, purpose is, uh, they made it, of, of course, five purposely to represent five times per year. They had one also gate which is closed and now opened. They used to call it a closed door. They only open it when uh, there is war from the western, uh, uh, west-east part. These gates, they are very important because uh, they want to control all enemies coming from uh, any direction because in the past they don't know where the enemy comes from. That was, they can check them and they control them. We are blessed today to be uh, in front of one of the important gates of the city of Hara. It is Baba Nas, and this is the gate of victory. It is one of the gates where the protection of the city uh, was maintained. And that is one of the blessings of the city of Hara, uh, where only 220 years ago, non-Muslims actually entered the city. It is a city of peace, a city of the scholars, and a city of high spirituality. So we are blessed today to be here uh, with the Ashraf of the city, uh, the nobles who are descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Al Hajj Kamil al Sharif, and the others have come today uh, along with the citizens. And we are blessed to be here at Tah. It is the gate of victory. And uh, we always pray that this city will again rise. Hara is now becoming a very important city, and it is rising back again uh, into importance in Africa and also in the Muslim world. To say Hadar is interesting would be an understatement. As I strolled around the old town, I was fascinated by the life it still breathed. It almost felt like I was taking a step back in time. <coughs> Traders were displaying their wares all over, and I could just imagine how it was like hundreds of years ago. This is a typical marketplace in Hara. For centuries, people have gathered together, bringing their wares from the countryside into the town. Hara is one of the most important centers for uh, civilization within Ethiopia. And the people brought their goods inside and traded and uh, came together from all different parts of eastern Ethiopia and northern Ethiopia. And so we see it here, typical uh, marketplace. Again, this could be in Pakistan, it could be in Egypt, it could be in Morocco. It gives you that flavor of life and activity and the bringing together of the uh, old and the new. baskets are now being made by our sisters. It takes one month of weaving to produce uh, one of these baskets. And you see the amount of patience that it takes and the skill. Um, and this is a tradition which has been passed on for hundreds of years in Hara. If really, if you look at the world, this is a thousands of year old tradition. Because you'll find similar type of weaving done in ancient India, uh, in other parts of Africa, in China, in Europe, and many parts of the world. But here in East Africa, there is a special form of this weaving and the design uh, is unique uh, to Hara and to Eastern here. Yeah. This is uh, the weaving of the culture of Hara, and you see again the designs and the colors of Africa and the Arab world. And um, these baskets have many purposes. Uh, they are being serve, serving food, uh, also protecting food. This basket is used uh, as a decoration in Hara houses. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, other baskets can be used for functional purposes as well as decoration mm -hmm. in, in the house. 
But is this one used on a special occasion? Uh, it's not used on a special occasion, but whenever uh, a young Hari woman mm -hmm. uh, marries a man and when she uh, go to her new house, right. she has to have six different types of uh, basketries yeah. and this is one of six. Like many parts of the Islamic world, um, the shops of Hara are a reflection of Islamic culture. What is special about the culture here is it combines Arab culture with African culture with the Islamic culture. So you see in the famous uh, kufiya, it is normally worn at the time of the wedding for the men. So this kufiya is special. Uh, it is worn at the time of the weddings and um, it has the special design as you see on the top of the cap. It's similar to many of the masjids and designs within the Islamic world. And what makes it special are the colors. The colors are African Ethiopian colors, uh, the green, the red, and the gold, and the black. Uh, and also you see the design. So with the beautiful designs, the blending together of the colors, you then come out with uh, a product which is unique. And that is part of Hara being a unique place, a crossroads between Arab culture and African culture, and also a base of Islam this cap is a reflection uh, of the culture of this mysterious, beautiful city. These are the narrow streets of Hara. Anywhere in the Muslim world you can find a, a village or a city with a similar flavor. And it is set up in such a way to protect the people who are living inside of the houses. The streets are very narrow and protective. And when you go inside of the door, uh, then you'll find that it opens up to a courtyard and the family then is protected from the outside world. And so Hara has followed in the uh, Arabic, African, uh, Islamic tradition in setting up its, its cities uh, in the same way. And uh, it's, it's a very beautiful town. The children are here, the families are here. There's the smell of spices. And um, that is something you find in Zanzibar and in Fez and Marrakesh and Lahore and all over the Muslim world. This narrow alley is one of the tightest in the city of Hara. And it has a special history to it. It is called the Reconciliation Street. And that is because it is so narrow that if people are fighting against each other or disagree, they have to, and they have to reconcile their differences. And so it is a special place that has brought people together. Um, and the whole spirit is, you know, we're tight, we're a family, so we need to really uh, uh, come clear with all of the arguments and differences that we have. We need streets like this all over the world. <laughs> Hara was also renowned for its books, mostly dealing with Islam and written at the height of the city's popularity as a Muslim stronghold. One man who's taken it upon himself to care and preserve many of the old texts, Sharif Ali. I collect uh, Hararian history, heritage, like this. In forest, uh, it was forbidden in the time of Haile Selassie, in the, in the time of military Dirk, military regime. But uh, at the fall of, uh, in the fall of uh, military regime, we, we get some freedom. So that uh, I began to, to collect with Harari songs, Harari coins, books, written documents, and uh, heritage about the surrounding people. 
Sharif Abdullah Ali represents a whole generation of people who have dedicated themselves to the preservation you know, of the history of the African continent. And um, what he has shown us is that by his own personal initiative, he has been able to collect over 500 uh, copies of Arabic documents from the past. He won the confidence of the people. He was able to bring out the, the, the culture of Hara that had been hidden uh, for years under the ground. And uh, right now, he estimates that there's about 20,000 uh, handwritten copies of books throughout Hara and its vicinity. And um, it is important that he has helped, that he has assisted, and that we actually culture a whole generation of Sharif Abdullah Ali's uh, who have the technical skill, the love, and the consistency uh, to be able to bring forward this tradition and to preserve it uh, for the modern world. And then you get the background where it says 122. The streets and alleyways of Hara throw up all kinds of surprises. As I rounded a corner, I stumbled on the graveside of one of the most prominent female saints, Sheikha Abida. Friday morning, Yom al Jumu'ah, an important day in the life of any Muslim. So too in Hara. Although there are 82 mosques in the city, this mosque, known as the Jumu'ah Mosque, is where the faithful gather for Friday prayers. Throughout my stay in Hara, I was often reminded not to be late for Friday prayers because it was unique. Now I've been to Juma in many cities all over the world, but what awaited me in this far off corner of Ethiopia was simply astounding. Every Friday, after the early morning prayer of Fajr, people gather in the mosque to recite the Quran. This practice dates back hundreds of years and the recital leaves one spiritually fulfilled and prepared for the prayers.
zatulu waladina gavaru wakadabu Ashhadu la ilaha illallah I left the Juma Mosque filled with admiration and pride as to how these Muslims managed to keep Islam alive and thriving. Juma in Hara was definitely one of the highlights of my stay, and I felt an even greater respect for this ancient city of Islam. <laughs> and as is customary all over the Islamic world, a delicious Harari lunch was prepared after the Friday prayers. Okay. Harar, uh, just uh, it counts uh, as a government more than uh, one millennium. Uh, it's almost uh, 1,100 and something years. Uh, it was established as a government, you know, at the turn of millennium. Of course, uh, the Haris uh, previously, they were not here. Uh, they are Semitic stock. They uh, are part of uh, Harla people. And so as a government, when it started uh, by Amir Hababa, and till uh, Amir Abdullah, uh, 72 rulers were, uh, or leaders uh, called them, uh, we call them in uh, uh, our uh, way Amirs, you know, been ruled uh, uh, till the end of 19th century. My stay in Hara had to come to an end, and I was looking forward to continue on my way through Ethiopia. Next stop was Nagash, the city of the Aksumite Christian king Ashama. He was the person who received and gave protection to the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, first Hijrah. The drive was long and tiring. The city itself is high up in the mountains.
My journey has been both insightful and fascinating. I've traveled from Addis to Harar and up into the north to the Tigray province and finally to the village of Nagash where sits the dedicated to Najashi. It is also a place of the burial ground of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and the king himself. So finally we have reached the final point, the beginning of Islam in Africa. فنحن نوجد في هذا المكان الطيب المبارك هو مكان أصل الملك النجاشي أصحم النجاشي ونحن قد دخلنا من المسجد الجامع الذي بناه المرحوم حج محمد عبدو الذي توفي سنة 1955 ميلادي وبعده تم تجديده على نفقة الشيخ حسين العمودي جزاه الله خيرا ثم دخلنا بعد ذلك بعد زيارة المسجد إلى هذا المكان الطيب بعد أن رأينا هناك مقابر للصالحين والأولياء عدة منهم الشيخ عمر أبرار ومنهم الشيخ الحاج نور حسين ومنهم الشيخ محمد الشيخ وإلى غير ذلك ثم دخلنا ونحن نوجد هنا في هذه الأماكن التي دفن فيها الصحابة رضوان الله عليهم الذين هاجروا من الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى الحبشة وتعتبر الحبشة هي دار الهجرة الأولى التي وصف النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالوسام الذهبي للملك وشهد له بالخير وشهد له كذلك بالعدالة فقال هاجروا في الحبشة إن فيها ملكا لا يظلم ولا يظلم عنده أحد. The word hijra in the Arabic language can refer to a flight or a migration. But what is important for us is that if we look at it Islamically, uh, it refers to movement. And it is a migration, a strategic migration, made from one area to another. The significance of the hijra, uh, in the case of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu number one is that the hijra represents the movement of the Muslims from out of a state of insecurity to a state of security. We know that in the Meccan period, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, came to Quraysh and came to the people of Arabia with the meshads of Tawheed. He found great opposition. And by the fourth year, his followers were being killed and tortured to the extent where they were not able to actually defend themselves. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, then um, saw the hijra as a means of releasing them from insecurity to a place of security uh, uh, and protection and freedom. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he sent his followers to Abyssinia, he sent with them a message. And this message or this letter uh, to a Najashi, the Negus, the emperor, the ruler of, e of, of Ethiopia, was in a form that we don't find in any other letter that he ever wrote. Because it was a brotherly letter. It was a diplomatic letter. So this letter was not only seeking sanctuary for his followers, it was actually a very strategic political letter that was connecting the Muslims in the Arabian Peninsula to the believers in one God in Ethiopia, which was a world power at the time.
The Quraysh, being the rulers of Mecca and being very familiar with uh, Abyssinia, when they found out that the migrants had gone to Ethiopia, they were terrified and they recognized that that movement could be a serious change in relationships between the Arabian Peninsula and between the people in uh, uh, Ethiopia. It could be a world power that could be backing the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So they sent Abdullah ibn Rabi Ahmad ibn As, who later became a very famous Muslim. They sent the two of them, who were known for their wisdom and their cunning and their diplomacy. They sent them to the, the Najashi, um, and basically they accused uh, the Muslims of breaking their religion, of disrespecting Christianity. The Najashi then um, called for the Muslims to come out, and he uh, questioned them. Uh, is it true what these people say? And we also know that the, that the two diplomats from Quraysh, they gave gifts to the courtiers and to, so they set everything up. But when the king asked the question to the Muslims, Jaffa ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, responded um, in a very beautiful way, explaining and showing how the Muslims were in a state of ignorance, they didn't respect themselves, they ate uh, uh, rotten meat, they drank uh, 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 intoxicants, they slaughtered the weak, they committed adultery, and then he read from Surah to Maryam. At that point, the Najashi cried, and all the people in his court cried, and the, and the Najashi said, by God, this revelation comes from the same candle, the light comes from the same candle that the Bible comes from. He said, I will never let them go, you are free to live in our lands. We find from the traditions that when the Najashi, may Allah be pleased with him, got the message from the Prophet ﷺ, that he actually reflected upon this and he secretly accepted Islam. And he was in correspondence with the Prophet, peace be upon him. Finally, um, the Prophet ﷺ, when hearing that the Najashi had died, he made uh, Salatul Janazah Lil Ghaib. He made a janaza prayer for the one who was absent, knowing that there was nobody, there wasn't anybody in uh, Ethiopia who would make it for him at the time. He had accepted Islam secretly. The Muslims lined up and they made janaza lil ghaib. It was the first time in Islamic history that, that this was done, and it is only done for a Muslim. And so, based on this correspondence, based on what happened with Najashi, what we know, he was a strong, firm believer before his death, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, confirmed this for all of the Muslims, and this is agreed upon by the ijma of the uh, historians and the fuqaha that he had accepted Islam, and so Islam had now entered this country at the hands of a leading personality. I had come to Ethiopia in search of the story of Islam. After leaving, I knew that my wish had been fulfilled. Islam is becoming the heartbeat once again of this ancient land of Abyssinia. I was surprised to find uh, that Muslims in Ethiopia have had a very powerful contribution to the history, not only of the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia, but really to the Muslim world and the rest of the world. Uh, and this is part of the well-kept secret of what has happened uh, in this part of the African continent. And we found that in the highlands of Ethiopia, um, that Muslims make up somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of the population. And the city of Hara not only was a great link for the Muslim world, but it was an important city for Ethiopia itself. It linked ancient Aksum, which was the great ancient empire of Ethiopia, with the modern world. So for instance, the coins of Hara, um, which were first struck uh, in um, the walled city of, 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 of Hara, these coins actually linked the, the Aksumite coins with the modern day uh, coins used in Ethiopia. So Muslims have made a great contribution to this land and uh, in the building of Addis Ababa um, we have come to understand that it was Harari, Masons and Arasans that actually helped to develop the city of Addis Ababa. So present day Ethiopia uh, has a great legacy, has a great debt um, in relationship 
to the Muslims. And so therefore it's important now um, with uh, Ethiopia coming out into the world um, and the different people, peoples within Ethiopia coming out that we are able to bring forward the Muslim contribution and to show that Islam did not come into Ethiopia as a conqueror but Muslims came as refugees. The Prophet Muhammad upon him called Ethiopia a land of truth. He sent his followers there before he sent them to Medina in the north, before they went to Jerusalem, before they went to Persia, before they went to Malaysia, they entered the African continent. And so this is very significant in our understanding of Africa and our understanding of the relationship between Muslims and Christians, that um, to a great extent um, there was cooperation uh, between the two groups. And so Islam in Ethiopia represents a very beautiful chapter if we're able to go through the veils and, and, and really see the contributions made uh, by the people in Ethiopia. I also believe that in the future, uh, Muslims will make a great contribution to Ethiopia because that knowledge of Arabic is still alive, that knowledge within the books of Hara uh, is still with them, and there are great peacemaking lessons within the teachings of the scholars of Hara. There are also great lessons of how to deal with science in a moral way, to blend the ancient with the modern, how to bring out um, the best in humanity in technology. And that is something that is missing in the world today. And I believe that Muslims in Ethiopia and in Hara and Nagash and Aksum in particular can make a great contribution not only to Africa, but to the world. No more do I look at Africa as the dark continent. What I found here has opened eyes to a whole new world of possibility that Africa offers. President Thabo Mbeki of South Africa speaks of the 21st century as the time of the African Renaissance. I say, let's look into the history of this majestic continent to kickstart the process. For me, the journey is only beginning, and I hope to explore many more untold stories of Islam and Africa.